Hi, this is Dr. Padma Garvey. Today, I'm going to be talking about health and wellness. And most of what I'm going to be discussing is based on the work of several prominent physicians who have been discussing these very uh, same topics for almost 30 years. And I will give you uh, references uh, later on in the talk to their to their body of knowledge and to their books. But I will credit them at the very beginning. Doctors like Caldwell Esselstein from the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Dean Ornish from UCLA Medical Center, Dr. T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University, uh, are just a few of some of the pioneer doctors who have worked a great deal in this area of medicine. This slide shows the number of deaths caused uh, uh, in the United States. And it's from the Center for Disease Control. And looking at this slide, you can tell that the number one cause of death is heart disease, followed by cancer, Chronic lower respiratory diseases refers to things such as emphysema or COPD or asthma. And then you have stroke, and most strokes are caused by the same type of problem that causes heart disease. And then you have accidents, Alzheimer's, diabetes, influenza, pneumonia, kidney problems, and suicide. Now, if you look at those causes of death, you see that 70% of these that deaths are actually caused by chronic conditions. So obviously, something like a car accident or a suicide uh, would not be a chronic condition, but the rest of the de deaths on that list are caused by chronic conditions and when you look at the root causes of these chronic conditions, you see that they're all preventable. Smoking, poor diet, a sedentary lifestyle. These three lifestyle issues are at the root cause of 70% of the deaths in the United States. Now, the Institute of Medicine looked at this list of deaths in the United States and looked at it from the perspective of how many of these deaths are actually caused by medical interventions and medical errors. So basically caused by people seeking medical treatment for these preventable chronic conditions. And what they found was that the third leading cause of death in the United States, when you look at things from this perspective, is actually medical care. Here I have a slide that shows three different pictures. Now, if any one of us stood very close to this smokestack, we would almost immediately feel some pain and discomfort in our throats. Our eyes would start to tear. We'd start coughing. We'd have almost immediate uh, sensations and immediate feelings of discomfort from the exposure to what's coming out of this smokestack. And we would recognize that the smoke is what's causing our problems and we would get away from it. Similarly, if I asked for volunteers to drink this glass of dirty water, I doubt anyone would volunteer uh, because we all kind of know that this dirty water is going to make us sick and that we would feel sick and we would feel ill pretty quickly after drinking it. Same way this moldy bread. I don't think any of us would be willing to eat this bread because looking at it, we can recognize that it's going to make us sick pretty quickly after we eat it. Now, this next slide shows another set of pictures. But the difference is that many of us will look at these pictures and not get that immediate clue that 
these are bad for us in some way. So many people will smoke cigarettes, maybe a few a day, or maybe a few a week, or maybe one or two packs a day. But because that exposure to cigarette smoke doesn't cause an immediate ill effect, because that exposure to cigarette smoke causes problems that we'll only start to experience 10 or 20 or 30 years later, some people don't have that same reaction to this cigarette that they do to the smokestack. Similarly, when we buy bottled water and it says clean and pure and fresh, many of us don't recognize that the plastic that that bottled water is coming in is oftentimes coated with chemicals such as BPA and that the water that we're consuming, even though it looks looks clean and pure, is contaminated with small amounts of these chemicals, such as BPA. And BPA has been linked to various forms of cancer. But because we don't taste it, because we can't see it, and because the effects of this exposure to these low levels of harmful chemicals aren't felt by us for 10, 20, or 30 years, we're unaware of it. Similarly, when we look at that slice of pizza, most of us aren't going to think that this slice of pizza is going to cause heart disease, diabetes, or increase my risk of breast or prostate cancer because it's, the effects are not felt for 10, 20, or 30 years. And so we don't have that same reaction, that gut, that gut instinct to, uh, to these different exposures the way we had to the first slide. And we have to actually be proactive and teach ourselves to have those same reactions to these hidden, subtle, chronic, uh, long-term health effects that are associated with these uh, uh, things that are depicted in this slide. So what I want to do during the rest of the talk is focus on nutrition. And I'm going to try and answer a couple of questions. Do we know what is the ideal way to eat? How do we know that this is the ideal way to eat? Do we know why it works? Why this ideal way of eating would work. I want to talk about why there's so much conflicting information out there, which is confusing to patients and to physicians. And then I want to talk about how we can convince other people to make a change, in an, in other people that are important to us in our lives, how we can convince, the, convince them to make a change as well. So let's start by asking what kind of a diet are you on? So there's the whole foods, unprocessed, low oil, plant-based diet, which I'm going to show you is the diet that prevents heart disease, the diet that prevents cancer, and the diet that prevents diabetes. And then there's the typical American diet, which is low in fiber, high in fat. And you might also think of this kind of a diet as the man boobs diet, the erectile dysfunction diet, the infertility diet, the bacterial vaginosis diet, the low T diet, the need your gallbladder removed at age 16 diet, and the get your period at age 9 diet. This <clears throat> pyramid graph depicts what is believed to be the ideal diet. And it's very different from the food pyramid that we were all trained with uh, or taught in elementary school. When you look at this pyramid, what you need to take note of is that the very bottom of the pyramid, the things that you need to eat the most of are green leafy vegetables. And then above that, fruits, and all sorts of vegetables. There are no bad green leafy vegetables, there's no bad fruit, and there are no bad vegetables. And the bottom of this pyramid is where we will get the most bang for our buck when it comes to fiber, 
when it comes to vitamins and minerals and nutrients that are valuable in protecting our genes, in helping us turn on and off bad genes in our bodies, in helping us turn on and off the bad genes in our fetus when we're pregnant. So the bottom of this food pyramid is really one of the most important parts of our diet. And if you think about it, it's really the salad that we eat. But when you order out at a restaurant or maybe when you cook at home, usually our salads are the smallest part of our meal. And truth be told, they probably need to be the biggest part of our meal. And then working up the pyramid, the second most important part of our diets should be whole grains, meaning unprocessed grains. So whole wheat, brown rice, quinoa, oats, barley, these kinds of foods, along with lentils and beans. This is where we're going to get the bulk of our protein and our carbohydrates. And we what we're going to get are complex carbohydrates, not refined sugar like table sugar. And then above that, we have nuts. And nuts are going to be a good source of omega-3 fatty acids for us, as well as all the other healthy oils that we need. And we don't want to get our carbohydrates from refined grains like all-purpose flour. And we don't want to get our uh, protein from uh, uh, refined processed food products. We want to try and get them from our whole grains and lentils and beans. And we don't want to get our uh, oils from processed oil like olive oil or canola oil or sunflower oil that we purchase in bottles. We want them in the, their natural forms, which is unprocessed nuts. And you notice that at the very top, what we really need the least of, and maybe not at all, is meat and dairy. You can get all the calcium, all the vitamin D, all the protein from a plant-based diet. So you can get all of that from what's underneath the very top of this pyramid. And meat and dairy, if you choose to eat them, should really be a very, very small portion of your diet. And by meat, I mean fish, eggs, poultry, beef, pork, anything that comes from an animal. Protein from animal sources is not necessary and does come at a price, which I'm going to explain as I later on. Here I have three different pictures, and each one is associated with a story that I'd like to tell in order to prove my point. The first shows President Clinton, and he's very open about his health, and so I'm going to talk about it here for a few minutes. While he was governor of Arkansas and president of the United States, he um, didn't hide the fact that he liked cheeseburgers and french fries and uh, spare ribs and that kind of food, and, and he enjoyed it. Shortly after he left presidency, he suffered a heart attack and underwent coronary artery bypass surgery. And after this event, he was obviously frightened, and rightly so. He followed the instructions that he was given by his cardiologists and followed the recommendations of the American Heart Association. He was very compliant. And despite doing this, about two years after his first heart event, he had another blockage in one of his arteries and needed angioplasty. And when this second event happened, uh, the media interviewed the 
the president of the American Heart Association and asked him, why did this happen even though the president followed the guidelines of the American Heart Association? And the president of the American Heart Association said that it's really all in his genes and that there wasn't much more he could do about it. That wasn't good enough for President Clinton, and he did some research on his own and came across the uh, writings of two prominent physicians who approached the management of heart disease in a very different manner from the standard recommendations of the American Heart Association. And President Clinton sought the assistance of Dr. Caldwell Esselstein from the Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Dean Ornish from UCLA. And both these two physicians recommended a much more uh, vigorous diet, and they put President Clinton on a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet. And after he followed the new diet, he lost about 30 pounds. And I think this was probably now about eight, nine years ago. He seems to be doing pretty well. The second uh, picture depicts two mice. <clears throat> and these mice are called agouti mice. And agouti mice have a gene called the agouti gene. And mice that have this agouti gene tend to have a golden coat, they tend to be obese, and they tend to have higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and certain cancers. So researchers did an experiment where they one group of pregnant mice got a, the equivalent of the typical American diet, and the other group of pregnant agouti mice got the equivalent of a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet. And when the two groups had their babies, the group that got the equivalent of the typical American diet had babies that had a golden coat, they had a propensity to become obese, they had higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and certain cancers. But surprisingly, the group of pregnant agouti mice that got the equivalent of a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet had babies born with brown coats who were thinner and had lower rates of heart disease, diabetes, and certain cancers. And what was even more startling was that when they looked at the actual genes of these two groups of babies, they saw that both groups had the identical agouti gene. It's just that one group, the gene was not turned off, whereas the other group, the gene was turned off. And the study is amazing because what it shows is that we can turn on and off the good and the bad genes in our bodies based on the type of foods that we eat. And it shows that our diets are incredibly powerful in altering our the expression of our genes. So it's not enough to say it runs in my family, it's in my genes, there's nothing I can do about it. The third picture shows a young man in Hawaii. And Hawaii is a really interesting state to look at during the early part of the 1900s, when the Dole Company was opening up uh, plantations growing sugarcane and pineapple and, and things like this, there was a great deal of influx of immigrants from various regions of Southeast Asia. People came from the Philippines, from Taiwan, from Okinawa, from Korea, and when these immigrants came to Hawaii they, in order to work on the plantations, like most immigrants, they continued to eat the way they ate in their home countries, which was predominantly whole foods, unprocessed foods, predominantly plant-based, and very low in oil. And 
these people were relatively healthy. They were, they tended not to be overweight and diseases like heart disease and diabetes and certain cancers was extreme. They were extremely rare in these immigrants. When these immigrants had children, their children uh, started consuming more of an American style diet than their parents ever did. And their grandchildren were consuming almost entirely an American style diet. And doctors in Hawaii quickly noticed that while the original immigrants remained very healthy, their children and their grandchildren had progressively higher rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and certain cancers. And in fact, it's popular in Hawaii to treat these problems by asking these grandchildren to start eating the way their grandparents did, which was mostly unprocessed foods, whole foods, plant-based with low oil. In this slide, I have pictures of three different people from various parts of the world. And each one of these people come from an area in the world called a blue zone. And a blue zone is a particular region in the world where people tend to live very long and healthy lives. There are about five blue zones on earth and one of them is Okinawa, Japan, which is the, um, where the, the woman in this slide series is from. Uh, another blue zone is Ikaria, Greece, where the gentleman in the middle of this slide is from. And a third blue zone is Loma Linda, California, where the third gentleman is from. And people in these blue zones tend to have uh, a great deal of health People in these blue zones tend to live to their 80s, 90s, and 100 or beyond at higher rates than any other place on earth. And people in these blue zones tend to eat uh, diets that are whole foods, low in oil, um, plant-based. And so uh, it really shows us that, that right now there are places on earth where people are demonstrating that the way you eat absolutely affects the way you live. Now, this connection between certain kinds of diets and diseases is nothing new. And in fact, if you go to any doctor who's gone to medical school in the United States and ask them if they have read Robin's textbook of pathology, they will say they have. Robin's textbook of pathology is one of the uh, pillars in medical education in the United States. And it is the book that analyzes and teaches doctors about the causes and the pathology of all the diseases that we're concerned about. And here I have two excerpts from Robin's textbook of pathology that illustrate that doctors have in fact been taught lessons from the blue zones it's just that we don't necessarily remember them anymore. So the first one says that surprising differences in the incidence and mortality rates of breast cancer have been reported for various countries. The risk for development of this disease is significantly higher in North America and Northern Europe than in Asia and Africa. For example, the incidence and mortality rates are five times higher in the United States than in Japan. These differences seem to be environmental rather than genetic in origin because migrants from low incidence to high incidence areas tend to acquire the rates of their adoptive countries and vice versa. Diet, reproductive patterns, and nursing habits are thought to be involved. With regards to prostate cancer, this is what Robin's textbook of pathology says. Increased consumption of saturated fats and red meat thought to be linked to prostate cancer. Consumption of lycopenes, such as in tomatoes and soybeans, seem to prevent it. 
significant differences in the rates of prostate cancer between Japanese and Americans exist. Increased rates in Japanese Americans, I'm sorry, and there's increased rates of prostate cancer in Japanese Americans than that compared to Japanese. Now, why exactly is it that this kind of a diet is ideal? And there's a couple of, of ways to look at this. You know, the root cause of diabetes is now known to be an accumulation of saturated fat in our cells. And that by the time someone has an elevated blood sugar in their blood, which is how most doctors diagnose someone with diabetes, by the time that's happened, the actual starting problem, the accumulation of saturated fats, has been going on for about 10 years. And when we treat diabetes by managing the sugar level in the blood and, and only focusing on that, we're not actually addressing the root cause of the problem, which is the accumulation of saturated fats in our cells, which is largely solved or, or greatly helped if you adopt a plant-based diet. By its very nature, a plant-based diet has lower saturated fat than a typical American diet would. Now, the root cause of atherosclerosis, which is the, the, the problem with heart disease and certain strokes, is an accumulation of cholesterol and saturated fat in our arteries. Drugs like Lipitor that do decrease cholesterol don't actually reverse the problem. They only slow it down uh, in a small number of people. And it's not patient specific. You know, there are some people that can't tolerate even a slightly elevated level of cholesterol. And lastly, medications like Lipitor, while they block your body from making its own cholesterol, they don't do anything to help you deal with the cholesterol you're eating. And again, a plant-based diet is the diet that has no cholesterol in it. Uh, cholesterol only comes from animal sources, not plants. And lastly, when you look at the root causes of most cancers like prostate, breast, colon, and uterine, as I said before, most of them, it is not genetic. In fact, Take the BRCA genes, which have been linked to certain breast cancers. About 5 to 10% of breast cancers are caused by a gene called the BRCA gene. But these genes have been around for about 10,000 years. So they do not explain the alarming rates, the alarming increase in the number of breast cancers in this country. The root cause is felt to be an excess of saturated fat and animal sourced protein that can stimulate cancer cells. And also the lack of powerful antioxidants and vitamins and minerals that literally turn our genes on and off that we find in a plant-based diet. A whole foods, low oil plant-based diet actually addresses all of these root causes. Now, why all the conflicting information then? You know, why is it that one doctor could be telling you that eating meat causes cancer, heart disease, and strokes, and doctors in the 50s and 40s could have told you that smoking camel cigarettes is better than any other cigarette around, and some groups tell us that eating carbs is really the problem with our, our uh, failing health in this country. And other groups tell you that you really need to eat the bulk of your calories and nutrition from meat, eggs, and fish rather than the green leafy vegetables. And some people will tell you that you have to have milk uh, in order to uh, promote health. Now, why is it that we have so much conflicting information out there? There's lots of reasons for this. I think the first reason is that since the 1950s and 60s, there's been a tremendous growth of knowledge in the inner workings of the human body. We have mapped out to great detail 
all the ser complex series of chemical reactions that occur in the human body. And it involves an unfathomable number of enzymes and reactions and chemicals and compounds, all interconnected in an immensely complicated way. And yet, even though we understand that the reaction and how all of these chemical reactions interplay in our body, even though we understand that it's complicated, we try and approach problems in medicine by focusing with some laser guided precision on just one enzyme or just one compound or just one chemical. We try and solve these complicated problems like diabetes and heart disease and cancer, we try and solve them by creating a pill that works on just one part of this unbelievably complicated system. And it's led to this approach of using pill after pill after pill because we are not actually dealing with the broader scope of these problems. Another issue at play is that the recommendations put forth by agencies such as the USDA are antiquated in some, in some instances or affected greatly by different food industries that have a great deal of power over what the USDA recommends as far as what we should eat and how much of it. And lastly, we're bombarded by advertising and slick uh, ploys convincing us that we don't have the time to cook, we don't have the time to eat fresh food, and that processed food is just as good for us if not better than anything we could possibly make on our own. Sometimes the media will sensationalize a particular study that gets published in a medical journal that they know will sell magazines, but will not actually discuss in a relevant manner the flaws behind the study and what was wrong with the study. Um, we also have food companies that push processed foods with slick packaging that makes us think that we're going to get all the nourishment and nutrients that we need in this packaged food and that somehow natural food isn't as good. And then we have a huge vitamin industry in this country that makes us believe that the no amount of vitamins that we need to promote health are massive, massive doses, and that our body is ill-equipped to absorb all the vitamins that we need from natural whole foods. But the sad thing is the exact opposite is true. The amount of vitamins and minerals and iron that we need to function is actually incredibly small amounts. And our body, if we provide it with healthy, unprocessed whole foods, knows exactly what to do. Sadly, a lot of these industry giants like the pharmaceutical companies, the food manufacturers companies, the meat and dairy industry, they have a lot of control now over what gets published in medical journals. Most medical journals uh, even have uh, members of their editorial team that are paid consultants of either these pharmaceutical companies or these various food industry companies. This is a quote from the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is really one of the premier medical journals. And Dr. Marcia Engel uh, after she left the New England Journal of Medicine as an editor, this is what she had to say, quote, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. 
I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Prior to the 1950s, medical journals did not have any advertising in their journals by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, most of the research that was published in medical journals was funded largely by universities or the government. And pharmaceutical companies and food and uh, drug uh, manufacturers did not support medical research uh, to the extent that they do now. The, these influences extend also to the uh, organizations that we rely on uh, many times in order to guide us about, about guidelines. For instance, uh, the new cholesterol guidelines that were released recently by the American Heart Association, uh, the new guidelines greatly increased the number of patients that would need drug therapy. But when, um, when it was examined, it was discovered that six of the panelists on the American Heart Association board had um, conflict of interest or they were either consultants or they received funding for their own personal research from various pharmaceutical companies that would have benefited by the new guidelines. Lobbyists for the meat and dairy industry and the food industry exert a great deal of control over USDA recommendations regarding food safety and food choices, and they exert this control through a small group of congressmen. A few years ago, someone uh, at the USDA was interested in, in starting a campaign for meatless Mondays and they wanted to develop commercials and public service announcements encouraging Americans to try avoiding meat for mo on Mondays. It was aimed at trying to get Americans to eat more healthy food, uh, trying to decrease uh, meat consumption in the American diet, and it was shot down and called un-American by a few congressmen who would not allow such a campaign to proceed. Even organizations like the American Diabetes Association, many of the physicians who are on the board who establish the guidelines work or are paid by companies like Coca-Cola. Uh, this also occurs with the American Cancer Society, the National Osteoporosis Foundation. All of these organizations have experts on their boards and on their panels that are paid in some way or another by companies like Coca-Cola, the makers of Boniva, the makers of medical equipments, and other specialty physician groups. In addition, one of the things that complicates the, uh, just the accepting of information is that most of the studies showing a link between dietary fat and breast cancer or uh, animal protein consumption and breast cancer in humans are studies that are called population-based or observational, meaning you look at the trends of large groups of people like, for instance, between Japan and Japanese Americans and Americans. And that, even, and that even though these studies consistently show a link between a certain way of eating and a certain medical problem, many people believe that population studies and observational studies um, can't prove that one particular thing actually caused another thing. And most of the studies that actually do prove a link between saturated fat or animal source protein and uh, breast cancer are done in laboratory animals. Recently, there was a study published in the journal Cell Metabolism that found that people who ate more animal sourced protein had higher rates of cancer than people who ate uh, plant sourced protein. 
And this was actually widely discussed in the media. And we started to see people talking about this issue and trying to uh, uh, see if this, if this was in fact true. And the timing couldn't have been more telling that almost the very uh, month after this study came out, Time Magazine had its picture of the butter, the uh, uh, pad, pad of butter telling uh, us that we were wrong in the first place. Depending on who's funding the study, depending on who's on, on the editorial board at the medical journal and who do they work for, uh, depending on which organization is uh, on the board of various medical groups and uh, organizations, you can get very different answers to some questions. For instance, which works better in preventing lung cancer? Never smoking or stopping smoking after you've started or doing chest x-rays and CAT scans every year on smokers? Which works better in preventing breast cancer? A whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet or doing mammograms starting at age 50, or doing mammograms starting at age 40, or genetic testing. Which works better in preventing established atherosclerosis, a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet, or Lipitor? Which works better in reversing the complications of established diabetes, a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet, or counting carbs, or drugs? Which works better in treating depression, sun therapy or drugs? It's very difficult for the average physician and the average patient to look at all of the studies that get published and really sort out which ones are biased and for what reason, who's funding the studies, what studies weren't picked for publication. That's the thing, we don't know of what studies were rejected for publication and for what reason. So oftentimes there's a lot of things that we are not seeing uh, in the media or in medical journals and we're not seeing them because of someone's bias sometimes. Also, numbers are always things that can be manipulated. And if you take Lipitor or drugs called statins, for instance, the average patient usually perceives that the statins work much, much, much more effectively than they really do. For instance, you know, birth control pills are 96% effective in preventing pregnancy. So if you take birth control pills, and you, if you have 100 women taking birth control pills accurately, at the end of a year, four of those women will get pregnant. So 96% of the time, birth control pills, when taken correctly, work. Well, what about statins? How well do they work? And statins reduce your risk for a second heart attack by about a third after taking them for five years. And studies looking at statins to see if they can prevent your first heart attack, some of them are poorly done, and even the ones that are well done show a benefit of about 17% in death, uh, reducing your risk of death by 17%. They reduce your risk of a first heart attack by 28% and they reduce your risk of a stroke by 22% over five years. So another way of looking at it would be taking a statin. You would need to take a statin. A thousand people would need to take a statin to prevent one death. Now, that's neither good or bad, and I'm certainly not saying that you should or should not take your statins, but what I'm trying to show is that your perception of how well these drugs work may be incorrect. So how do we convince people to look at the information that they've been given in a different angle? One is to spread the word, such as I'm trying to do. 
Uh, there's also a couple of books I would recommend you try reading. One is The Blue Zones by Dan Butner. Another one is Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. There's a great video called Forks Over Knives. Dr. Dean Ornish has a really great book called The Spectrum. Dr. T. Collins Campbell has a great book called The China Study. And as far as agencies that do by and large provide unbiased advice and sources that I do go to, I recommend looking at the U.S. Preventative Task Force and the National Cholesterol Education Program. Now, time is limited, but I do want to stress that food alone is not enough here. You know, the other things that we need to address is um, our sedentary lifestyle and stress reduction. And I refer my patients to a free website that I found. It's excellent. It's called www.doyogawithme.com. They have some 200 free downloadable yoga classes, and it's a great way to address our sedentary lifestyle and our stress reduction. I recommend to high school students here sitting in front of me that you cut your time in front of the monitor by 20%. Uh, there are lots of nice tech devices now that help you monitor how active you are, like Fit Bands. We're lucky to have an area filled with rail trails, places that you can go to for free, or even just read a book or participate in your community and your family. We also shouldn't minimize that a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet is good for the earth also. It's good for us, but this is a win-win here. It's also good for the earth. You know, the way that we are eating now with an o over-dependence on milk and dairy and processed foods. These are all ways of eating that require a tremendous amount of fossil fuels. This way of eating produces an enormous amount of greenhouse gases. And switching to a plant-based diet will really help decrease greenhouse gas emissions. For the remainder of the talk, I thought it would be fun to just go through a couple of slides where we actually look at food and try and compare things. And so if I were to ask you which of these two food items would have more protein, many of you might be surprised to learn that they're equal, that an eight ounce glass of milk and a baked potato with the skin both have about the same amount of protein, which is eight grams. And yet it's not marketed that way. The way things are marketed, we're led to believe that milk is a much better source of protein. But if I were to ask you which one has more saturated fat, you'd have to say the milk. The baked potato uh, with nothing on it has no saturated fat. Which one has more fiber? The potato. The milk doesn't have any real fiber. And which one has more cholesterol? And it would be the milk uh, because plants do not uh, have cholesterol in them. You know, if we were to look at some um, oven roasted turkey or a cup of cooked quinoa, let's compare. And which has more protein? Well, uh, three slices of oven roasted, pro uh, oven roasted turkey breast has slightly more protein than a cup of cooked quinoa, but not all that much more. And the cup of cooked quinoa has an enormous amount of fiber. It has no cholesterol whatsoever, whereas the turkey does have cholesterol and does have saturated fat. The cup, cook of cupped quinoa has no cholesterol, no saturated fat, and much, much more vitamins. If we were to compare processed oil versus fat from a plant, uh, there's a lot we can learn here. You know, uh, one tablespoon of olive oil has 120 calories from fat, whereas half an avocado has just as many calories from fat. The difference, though, is that the avocado has lots of fiber. It also has lots of vitamins and much, um, and it's just much more nutritious for you. It's a much better way of getting your fat. If we were to compare these two food items, uh, the tropical smoothie uh, 
makes it makes it look like it's really healthy for you and they do use fresh fruit but all their smoothies come with a cup of uh, an additive called that they call turbinator and when you really look at what this turbinator is it's mostly refined sugar and um, added additives in the uh, form of flavorings and colorings and there's all, no there's not nearly as much fiber as if you just ate a fruit salad. If we compared these two muffins, uh, one is definitely going to be better for us than the other. The, you're, if something is labeled as 100% whole wheat, then by law it has to be made only with 100% unprocessed whole wheat. So the muffin on the right is going to be made with only 100% whole wheat which means it's got more protein and more fiber than the muffin on the left. The muffin on the left might have a little bit of whole wheat, but it's mostly going to be all-purpose flour, which is refined. If we compare cheese to nuts, um, definitely the cheese has more cholesterol. In fact, even though cheese is marketed as a healthy food, it's actually not that much different from ice cream. It's just concentrated cholesterol and concentrated saturated fat. Whereas if you looked at the nuts, nuts in moderation, so you can't have nuts galore, but nuts in moderation have no cholesterol, no saturated fat. They have healthy oils such as omega-3s and they have some fiber also. I hope that my lecture has been useful and I hope that you've at least walked away uh, with the notion that a lot of what you're hearing on the media is not accurate and one of the healthiest ways to live and, and eat is the ways that we already see being played out in the blue zones around the world. Uh, and I encourage you to at least try even for a week or two weeks or three weeks, try a whole foods, low oil, plant-based diet. Thank you.